The Bible, uh, for me, is a guidebook. I think it's inspired by God, and I do think it's filled with inaccuracies. And you'll see things in there that remind you of yourself, and it'll make you really want to change. You'll realize that that Bible's not lying to you, but it's telling you truth. It's just a storybook written by some people about some character. There's plenty of things that even if you don't believe in God, there's plenty of things in the Bible that can improve your life. I personally don't think everything should be taken literally. The Bible? Mm, that's controversial. <laughs> Thank you for asking. The Bible is still here. It, this book is almost 2,000 years old. It, it still exists for some reason. And to me, that stands out. That means something. It's not coincidence. I started watching football religiously probably when I was around in uh, junior high age. Um, during that time, well, I knew of the 49er legendary quarterbacks, Joe Montana, Steve Young. But by that time, by the time I started watching football, um, they had already retired. And so when I started watching, my quarterback was Jeff Garcia. I don't know if any of you remember him, but he was just such a, I really enjoyed watching him. Um, I don't know if you remember the team. They were a pretty, pretty good team. Um, I don't know if you remember Terrell Owens. Um, he was one of their wide receivers. Uh, he was kind of a diva. Um, there was Garrison Hurst. He was one of the running backs. And there was Bryant Young on the defensive side. He's one of the defensive linemen. But I was such a... Um, big fan of Jeff Garcia that whenever I had a chance to um, play football in junior high, I would always kind of try to copy or emulate the way that he played. Um, however, when I was in junior high, our school wasn't very wealthy, so we didn't have a football field. What we had was um, this big kind of parking lot area that was just a parking area with gravel and so what we did was we would play touch football or flag football and so because we didn't have any uh, football equipment so like I said we weren't very wealthy but regardless I had a lot of fun playing football and whenever I would play and have the chance to be quarterback I would try to copy my uh, quarterback my favorite quarterback at the time Jeff Garcia um, I'll never forget my first game. I'll never forget my first game, the live game that I went to um, for the 49ers. I remember going there with my dad. It was on a Sunday. It was super hot. It, the game started at 1, one o'clock um, in the afternoon. And I remember I was trying to figure out which um, game that I wanted to watch, the game that I wanted to go to my dad with. And I decided to go to a game where the 49ers would play the Cleveland Browns. Now, I don't know if you remember the Cleveland, Cleveland Browns around that time. <clears throat> they weren't a very good team. So I was very conscious of trying to choose a game that the 49ers had a good chance of winning. And that's why I chose the Cleveland Browns. No offense to the Cleveland Brown fans. But I remember going to the game and... I had this big, uh, I had this jersey, a Jeff Garcia jersey, because I was a big fan, right? And the, the jersey was big, kind of a big, uh, it was an adult-sized jersey, and I was just kind of this short, scrawny, um, skinny uh, junior high kid. And uh, so the, the jersey was just an adult size because we couldn't find um, one size that fit me. So the, the, the jersey was so long that it kind of went up to my, the sleeves went down to my forearms and the jersey went down and it went would go up to my thighs. <clears throat> so it kind of looked like I was wearing a skirt. Um, but I was it was it looked like a skirt, but anyway, I were I was wearing jeans underneath. So anyway, um, I remember that was my first game, uh, uh, the 49er game against the Browns, and they lost. You know, I was trying to pick a game where the Niners would win, but they lost. And even though they lost, though, I will never forget. I'll never get, forget that experience uh, with my dad. 
One aspect of sports that I've started to appreciate over the past or since then, and especially over the past few years, is how sports teams would have slogans, kind of slogans and phrases that would, they would have as a, would you say, a mindset or a culture for that season. For example, a few years ago for the 49ers, they had this slogan um, while Jim Harbaugh, wa Jim Harbaugh was their coach. And it went, I'll show a picture over here. It went, who's got it better than us? Nobody. And I like that. I like that slogan because it kind of gave, the purpose of it was to give the team this mindset that it doesn't matter what happens to us, whether we win or we lose, kind of gives this positive and uplifting mindset that no matter what, nobody has it better than we do. Um, the, one, the one slogan that I really appreciate rec uh, recently is faithful then, faithful now. Because us 49er fans, we call ourselves faithful. And so it, when it says faithful then and faithful now, we're talking, we talk about how whether or not the 49ers lose or whether or not they win, we are faithful as fans and we call ourselves faithful. So I think that's a little, little fun to watch. So more fun, fun to, uh, to hear, faithful then, faithful now. I don't want to neglect the Golden State Warriors. I think that my favorite slogan uh, came in the 2006-2007 season, and it was, We Believe. And um, I really liked that slogan because during the time, the Golden State Warriors, they weren't very good. They weren't very bad either. They were kind of underdogs. And who doesn't like an underdog story? So the idea of we believe is that no matter where we are or no matter where we are in the season, we, and even though we're underdog, um, underdogs, us fans, we believe, and the team believed that we could still win a championship. But whether or not you're a fan of sports, whether or not you're a fan of the teams here in the Bay Area, or you have, uh, you're a fan of another team somewhere else, maybe you're a fan of the Cleveland Browns, there is no denying that slogans, these slogans that I've mentioned, or few words or simple words, have amazing repercussions. What I mean by that is amazing repercussions. So. Slogans like these, few words, simple words, can help bring a team together and motivate them to win. It brings out the best version. It help, can help bring out the best version of the players. And it reminds them that, it can remind the players that they are part of something bigger, right? They are part of a team. They are part of a city. And so the slogans can be very powerful and can have amazing repercussions. However, there are some of us who rarely have positive slogans in their life. Some of us don't hear them often. Some of us have rarely heard them in our life. And in fact, sometimes we hear the opposite. Sometimes we're criticized. Sometimes we're judged. Sometimes we're discouraged. Because it doesn't, you and I know, and it doesn't take many words to change the way that we feel about ourselves, or it doesn't take many words to change the way that we feel or our outlook on the world. And what I mean by that is, I'll kind of give you an example. Someone comes up to you, or someone in your life that you know, whether it's someone you're close to or someone not, they say something to you like, you are, you're too weak. You'll never get it. You're a disgrace, or even worse. Sometimes you hear worse phrases. You hear, um, I guess you can call them worse slogans. So these slogans, these kind of slogans, these kind of phrases, they have terrible repercussions. For example, let's say that you're trying to choose a career, whether you're in junior high or you're in high school, or maybe even as an adult, you're trying to choose a career. And let's say you want to be an actress or an actor, and you dream about being a, um, 
astronaut or a, or a doctor. But someone, somewhere in your life, they say, you know, that's just not realistic. You're not made to be a doctor. You don't have the skills to be a doctor. That is too risky to become an actor or an actress. Or maybe let's say you're in a relationship or you have been in a relationship and you're trying your best to work out that relationship. You're doing every, that, everything that you can to help you understand or help your spouse understand, but your spouse comes up to you and they often say to you, you're just not getting it. Or you, why can't you figure it out? Why do I have to keep telling you what to do? So what does it do? It makes you a little hesitant, right? A little hesitant to move on and maybe try to find another spouse. Or maybe you've been bullied, right? When, maybe you've been bullied uh, when you were younger. And the bully said that you're ugly and you're weak and nobody would love you. And it's normal. And those, when you hear those things, to feel discouraged. And it's normal to maybe get so bad it might want to make you give up. So what we can see is that it's few words and, few, and, and stories that, help, that can affect us, that will affect the way we look at ourselves. But not just that, these stories and these words, these few words sometimes often also affect people around you. So like your friends and your family and people that you just come across daily, it could and it might affect them because it might affect them because the words that you've heard, the stories that you've learned um, have been, you remember them either subconsciously or consciously. Everyone has words that they'll never forget. I'm sure there's words that you can think of now, what you've heard in the past that you'll never forget whether it's from a teacher or from a friend. But what, and what we do know is that words shape our story. The words shape our journey. The way that we look at life, it shapes them. It shapes it. So what I want us to do today is I want to talk about stories. And I want to talk about the effect of words. And we're specifically going to look at the Bible. And we're going to specifically ask, is the Bible reliable? And what we're doing today is we're basically connect, uh, continuing our series, uh, Explore God. And it's been an amazing series because there's 200 uh, churches here in the Bay Area who are per participating in this series. And what we're doing, if you haven't heard about the series yet, is we're talking about and asking seven questions regarding or relating to God and faith. And when we talk about uh, these questions, our goal isn't to convince you of something. We're, our goal isn't to convince you to come to our church. Rather, it's for us to inspire you to engage in a conversation and um, encourage you to explore these questions about faith and God together. So I just, I also, that being said, I do want to start by saying that no matter how, as I, as I go through this message, no matter how I try to convince you that the Bible is real, no matter how I try to convince you of its relevance and its legitimacy, I understand that we can never present, I can never present an argument that is undisputable. I, under, I understand. I do my best to try to understand that. But what I do know is that over thousands of years, many people have been affected, have been affected by this book. Right? Many people have based their lives on this book. So instead of asking today, is the Bible reliable? Maybe instead we should ask, why do so many people put their trust and their faith in the Bible? So what I want us to do today is I'm going to talk through, uh, talk us through a series of steps to help us answer this question, why do so many people put their faith and trust in the Bible? And this is where we are going to start. We're going to start in the second um, Timothy, second Timothy. And it says here, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and 
training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what, I, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to understand how the Bible refers to itself. And so Timothy is saying here that all scripture is God breathed. So we're going to look into that idea more in, um, with Luke. And he says in uh, the book of Luke and says, uh, 11, 28, Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So um, this is going to sound obvious, but try to follow me for a second. Speaking, using the words, is our, our primary way, way of sharing and communicating um, ideas and experiences. It's like, that's how we do it, obviously. But I want us to do a little, or I, I want to invite you to do a little experiment with me, a little test. So what I want to, uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through it, and this is how it's going to go. First, I want you to... Think of one word that you're that you will that can describe your entire week, right? Think of one word, and I want you to look to someone. Maybe there's someone next to you, but maybe there's some there's not anybody watching with you. So just imagine that there's someone there. I guess. So what I want you to do is to sh use one word to describe your entire week and share that with the person next to you. And um, remember that one word that you told them, and remember that one word that they told you. Okay? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. So we have the words. Remember the words that you heard, the word that you heard, and that one word that you said. So first, for that one word that you heard, remember that one word that you heard, do you feel like you got a good idea of what their week went, how their week went? And for... Those of you, or when you said one word, do you feel like that one word described the week enough for you? Because what we know is that all of us have gone through so much this week, right? Everything that happened at school, everything that happened at work, all of the emotions that we felt, what we ate for dinner, what we talked about our spouse about. So how can one word, how can one word summarize an entire week? Right? Wouldn't we need like hundreds and thousands of words to even try to describe the little details of how our week went? But I also want you to think about this. Think about it from a different perspective. Think about it. When you hear that, when you heard that one word that, that someone told you, didn't many ideas, multiple ideas come to your mind? What I mean is, I'll give you an example. So I say that my week was confusing. Just one word, my word to you is confusing. And I'm sure when I told you that one word, there were um, ideas and mul multiple ideas and experiences that came to your mind, right? So you're thinking, Jeff, uh, what did he mean when he said confusing? Maybe he's talking about he was confused at work, or maybe he was confused with his spouse. What does he mean by confusing? So those ideas that came to your mind and there's that person next to you who also heard confusing from me. I have different ideas. Maybe that person next to you is thinking, oh, Jeff must be confused about his car. And you thought maybe I'm confused about work, like I said. So even, my point is, even one word can communicate many ideas and expressions. So... When Timothy is saying all of Scripture is God-breathed, what we're saying is, what he's saying is, the Bible is one way that God is trying to communicate with you. You can think of it like the Bible is God's letter to you. So what we're seeing is that the Bible refers to itself as the Word of God, right? God-breathed, the Word of God. And what, he's, what God is trying to do here is, through the Bible, is he's trying to communicate with you. He's trying to, to reveal himself to you, right? But God, so God is trying to communicate with you, right? We establish that the Bible refers to itself as the word of God, and, God is trying, and through it, God is trying to communicate to you. But also, what if there was something deeper to that idea? We're going to get into that as we look into 
the book of John, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John was one of Jesus' best friends. And if you look at the verse here, it says, In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. So when you see the beginning was the Word, you can, if you see it, that's just by itself, it's just a statement, right? In the beginning was the Word. Then after that, it kind of shifts a little bit. The, the verse shifts a little bit. It says the word was with God. So the word with, by saying the word with, the word was with God. Now you're separating God from the word, right? There's God with the word. But then there's another shift after that. And it says, it says the word was God. So what if the word was not just a set of words, but instead a person. Instead, what if, instead of using the phrase, the word, in that verse, you replace it with the word Jesus, rather the name Jesus. So we read it this way, right? In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. So remember, God, the Father, was trying to, is trying to communicate with us through the Word, through the Bible. But God, and God is also trying to reveal himself to you. So this is saying, or what John is saying, is that Jesus is also trying to reveal himself to you. This is one of Jesus' way to try to communicate with you. And then we continue in the book of John, and it says, The Word became flesh. And his dwelling among, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen the glory, his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, when it says the word, right? Jesus, as a person, became here to earth and became one of us, right? And what he did, one of the things that he did, is he spoke to thousands of people, right? He was he would travel to different cities with his disciples, and he would speak to thousands and thousands of people. And he spent time with the worst of the worst, right? He spent time with what the world would say is the lowest of the lowest. The weak, the, the, what the world, would the world would describe as not good enough. Yet, Jesus was kind to these people. Jesus loved them. Jesus forgave them. So when he was here, when he was with us, he made a difference in so many, in thousands of lives, because the way that he was here on earth was not the way that the world expected, the, that the world was. Right? Jesus was different. The way that he approached things, the way that he, he did people was different than how everybody else was. Because, and the thing is, right, he made a difference in all of their lives, thousands of lives back then, and he continues to make that difference difference in lives now because now there are 2.3 billion Christians right now and part of his message part of the message Jesus has been trying to tell us through the Bible one of his messages is this we can see this verse in Corinthians and it says love is patient love is kind it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the tr in, with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So we're asking this question, right? Why do so many people put their trust and their faith in the Bible? Well, it's not hard to look outside, to go outside into the world and see horrible things that are happening. It's, it's not hard to go onto your phone and see the terrible things that are happening in the world right now. Right? The, ter the terrible things that are happening in, your, happening in your life. The insane things that we're seeing out there in the world. So, if you look at this verse, you go back to this verse in Corinthians. And you replace the word love with Jesus, it reads this way. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. 
Jesus does not dishonor, dishonor others. It is not, Jesus is not self-seeking, not easily angered. It, Jesus keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Jesus never fails. You look at this, right? You look at this verse, and like I said, it's not hard to see the terrible things that are happening right now in the world. And so the world is desperate for this kind of love. The world is desperate for these kind of characteristics that were mentioned here, these kind of characteristics that we describe here as Jesus, right? Jesus is kind. He tr he's He's always protecting, he's always trust, he always hopes, and he always perseveres. I mean, what kind? We don't see those characteristics often nowadays. We don't see enough of it. I mean, do you go outside and, and, and do you, how, how many people, or how often do you see people sharing or, or with these characteristics? But what the Bible does is the Bible gives us a chance to see stories that have these, these um, characteristics. And yes, the Bible does have stories of failure and suffering, but that's how life is, right? No matter what we do in life, there will be tragedy, there will be sadness, there will be loss, there will be challenges. And the Bible is full of those stories. But even though the Bible is full of those stories, there are also stories of hope, right? There's also stories of perseverance. There are stories of grace and forgiveness and love. Because so even though there are stories of difficulties, just like we experience in life, there is also stories of grace, love, forgiveness. And that is why the Bible is still relevant today that's why Jesus has made a difference in thousands of years and continues to make a difference today. Because there are more historical documents of the Bible than any other book in history. The, book was, the, the Bible was written um, over uh, 1,500 years ago. It's composed of 66 different books, about 40 different authors. It's been translated more than 700 languages. But... Whatever those, whatever these stat statistics that I've mentioned, whatever interpretations that there have been, there has been a consistency in its teachings. Because the interpret interpretations don't change the fact that there is a cohesive story. Right? The central message and the central message of the Bible has not changed, and that is Jesus has paid the price for us. We are all sinners. We were all supposed to pay the price. We were supposed to. We were supposed to be the ones who were suffering. We we're supposed to be the ones who wouldn't have a second chance. But Jesus paid the price so that we do have that second chance. He paid the price that we were supposed to pay. And so, instead of saying and listening to what the world says, the words that you hear. The, the simple few words. Jesus sees you as a masterpiece. It says here in Ephesians, for we are God's masterpiece. Masterpiece. He created us anew in, in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You are his masterpiece. One word simple word, amazing repercussions. Because no matter what other people say, no matter what the world says about you, whether or you're not, you are Christian, Jesus sees you as his masterpiece. And what the Bible has done throughout history is it has changed lives. And there are people who have based their lives on the Bible. They have based their their marriages, their parenting, their, their financial management, their friendships, their friendships, their, their lifestyles, their careers in the words of the Bible. 
and what has that and these people what they have done is they have left an amazing legacy throughout thousands of years with through millions of people they have left a legacy that is generous that is kind that is gracious so is the bible reliable they thought so i think so when you you might hear words right? you might hear words like disappointment god will never be disappointed you might hear the word unworthy but god will always see you Thank you for joining us for this week's message. Grace Point Church is located in South San Francisco, California. For additional content or to find out more information about Grace Point Church, visit us online at wearegracepoint.com.